All right, so now let's start with airway for PALS. And I thought we would start with looking at oxygen delivery. So we're looking at the flow of oxygen through the blood and eventually getting it to the end organs. Now this is determined uh, by the blood flow, but it, oxygen is carried in two ways. It is dissolved in the plasma and also it's carried by hemoglobin. So plasma uh, dissolved oxygen is, married, is measured on your ABG and that in the hemoglobin bound oxygen is measured it's, uh, uh, by your pulse oximetry, your oxygen saturation. And the plasma uh, dissolved oxygen plays a very small role compared to the hemoglobin bound oxygen. And the other thing that, that is an important factor is actually the cardiac output, the thing that propels this oxygen through the blood vessels. So any problems in the system can affect our oxygen delivery. So let's say that cardiac output is not good. So now that is going to decrease oxygen delivery. Or even patients with anemia, maybe they don't have enough hemoglobin to carry the blood. Sorry, they don't have enough hemoglobin to carry oxygen. So that also affects oxygen delivery. But one thing you should know, I mean, what we would do in that case is we would probably crank up the oxygen and try to increase the amount of free-floating oxygen in here, but if we don't have enough red cells to carry it, it's not going to be enough because remember, this only plays a small role. If you wanted to see this mathematically depicted, I have it here, uh, where you could see that the hemoglobin times the oxygen sat times 1.39 plus 0 0.003 times the PaO2. So I told you, this plays a tiny role. Look at this constant here, you're multiplying it by 0 0.003. And here, you're in fact increasing it by 1.39. So you add these two up, this is the oxygen content of the blood, and you multiply that times the cardiac output, and that gets you the oxygen delivery. But don't worry about that. That's really irrelevant. Just remember that some big determinants are the cardiac output and the hemoglobin, as well as the oxygen saturation. That is how many of these binding sites on the hemoglobin are filled up. So now let's talk about some ways that we can get air into the body. And I've drawn uh, a body here. I've depicted it So with my crude drawing. So here's the nose, here's the mouth. It all goes into the pharynx. Here you have the esophagus leading to the stomach. And in here you have the, the, um, the epiglottis right here, the vocal cords here, the trachea, and that leads to both of the lungs. So one thing that can happen in an obtunded child or adult, is that the tongue can fall back and obstruct the airway, could hit the, hit the back of the pharynx there. So there are two devices we can use. Well, actually, you can start with uh, the maneuvers like the chin thrust, chin thrust, the jaw lift, uh, chin thrust, um, head tilt, those things that can also try to bring the tongue forward. But we have two devices we can use. The first is an oral airway, which is a hard plastic piece that kind of comes back here and it lifts the tongue off the back of the uh, hypopharynx. Now you have to be sure to use one that's properly sized because if you use one that's too small it might not reach far enough back here. It may actually even just push the tongue back even further. If you use one that's too big it itself may obstruct the airway. Now the oral airways are hard and plastic and they're just obnoxious to stick in someone's uh, throat so they're good for people who are completely obtunded. For people who are maybe a little bit awake and they don't tolerate this, you can use a nasal airway. And this works in a very similar way in the sense that it, it kind of gets puts some space in between the tongue and the back. And it's actually hollow as well. And so you can actually send air through here if you need to bag them or whatever and get it in there. And this is soft and flexible. So it's a little bit easier to tolerate. But if you're completely awake, you're not going to want this shoved down your nose either. And those are typically used in conjunction with a non-invasive ventilation, uh, such as this, which is a bag valve mask, or BVM for short. And here you have to get an appropriate size mask that covers the nose and mouth and has a tight seal so air can't escape from around it. There's a valve here and a bag, and you squeeze the air in here and hopefully get it to go, not in there, but it probably some will go into the stomach, but also some will go into the lungs. 
And this is this poor drawing is supposed to be the hand of the rescuer who's doing the bagging. So how much are you supposed to bag? Well, it depends on the number of rescuers you have. If you have one rescuer, you're going to do 30 chest compressions, then you're going to pause, then 30 chest compressions, then you're going to pause. Now, if you have two, you can do 15 chest compressions and pause, 15 chest compressions and then pause. Now, this pause is important. During this pause, you're going to give two breaths. So it's going to be 15 chest compressions, a pause with two breaths, then 15 chest compressions again, then a pause with two breaths. Similarly, for the one rescuer, it's going to be 30 compressions, a pause, two breaths, 30 chest compressions, then a pause, and two breaths. So this pause is different than in adult uh, re uh, ACLS. So I think the pause is there because if you're doing chest compressions, you're not going to be able to efficiently get the breaths in because you'll be compressing the chest. And you give only enough uh, air to see the chest wall rise. You don't want to give too much because if you give too much, that increases the intrathoracic pressure. And if this pressure increases too much, it's going to squeeze on this IVC, which means you're not going to get that much blood back up to the heart. And so you're not going to get that much preload. You're not going to get very much venous return. So it's important not to be overzealous when you bag. Just look to try to get only enough to see the chest wall rise. Another device you can use is what's called an LMA, or laryngeal mask airway. And what that is, is this uh, triangular shaped thing. It has a balloon, a big balloon on here, and it's attached to this tube. And you blindly pass this through such that the pointy part of the triangle hopefully kind of lodges in the esophagus and this lodges above it. And now, when you introduce oxygen through here, it will hopefully go in like this. Now yes, some of it might go in here, but we're hoping that most of it is going to go into the trachea. Now one problem with the LMAs is if the patient has just doesn't have an empty stomach, then it's certainly possible that they could vomit and it'll hit the LMA and just bounce right back in here and now they've aspirated it. It goes into their lungs. So it doesn't protect against aspiration, but it is a way to get oxygen in to the trachea and lungs. And obviously you're shoving this big thing down their throat, so it's possible that it could cause coughing, it could even cause laryngospasm, uh, so just be aware of that. Now the ultimate airway device is called an ET tube, or an endotracheal tube, and that's basically a flexible plastic tube that goes through the vocal cords and it gets into the trachea, and it's a uh, provides uh, oxygenation and ventilation through this. This comes through here, then it gets through there and goes through there. Now, uh, there are two kinds of endotracheal tube. There are ones that don't have cuffs at the end, those are balloons, and there are ones that do. The cuffed ones, the ones that we use, we use commonly in adults, uh, it's meant to provide a barrier here. The tube gets in and now this balloon fills up the rest of the space, so should the patient vomit, it can't, they can't aspirate because it won't get past this balloon. Now the difference in kids is that it's this area right below the vocal cords, the subglottic area, that is often the narrowest. And so you don't need a cuff because you just stick the tube in and it pretty much fills up the whole space. Uh, the new PALS guidelines say you can use a cuff or you don't have to use a cuff. If you're going to not going to use a cuff, you stick an appropriate size tube in. If you're going to use a cuff, you're going to have to use a uh, 0.5 millimeter smaller tube to accommodate that cuff space. So how do you know what size to use? Well, I would probably start by consulting my Breslow tape, which is basically this color-coded tape that you lay down and you put the patient right right next to it and then you see which color they match up to. If they're in the green one, then you, you read right here on the within the tape, it tells you what size of everything to use. If you don't have one of those, then you could follow this rule of thumb here. For less than one, you use a 3.5. For one to two, use a size four tube. If they're greater than two, use four over the age divided, four plus over the age divided by four. Now, if you're going to use a cuffed tube, just subtract 0.5 from all of these. So instead of using a 3.5, use a three. Instead of using a four in the one to two year olds, you use a 3.5. And instead of using this formula, four plus the age over four, use 3.5 over the age plus four. 
This way you can accommodate for that cuff size. Now let me make one note, whenever you're intubating, anyone, adult or kid, always have one size larger and one size bigger because these are just estimations. You don't know if this is going to work. This might be too big and you might not be able to pass it. If that's the case, have ready at hand a 3.0. In kids, I'll have even a 2.5 because I just want to have everything I need ready to go. So intubating is a learned skill. It's a difficult skill in kids too, but it, it's possible and you could do it. Once you do it, how do you know that you're in the right spot? Well, there's a couple of things you can do to confirm proper placement. The first thing is to look for chest wall rise when you are uh, bagging them through the ET tube. So also you could listen in the axilla for breath sounds and the other place I would listen to is over the stomach because if, if you don't get this in the trachea, where else is it going to go? It might go in the esophagus. So you want to listen in the stomach to make sure you're not hearing breath sounds in the stomach. There are also uh, CO2 detectors that will change from yellow to purple and back to yellow and back to purple with each breath. And there's also waveform capnography where you have a a tube that connects to here that actually measures the number, the amount of, of CO2 with each breath. And that would be a great way to make sure that you're getting, that you're in the lungs, because that's presumably what's going to be making the uh, CO2. And you would, of course, also get a uh, post-intubation chest x-ray to make sure that you haven't shoved that ET tube in too far and it's going into the right main stem. You would instead like to see it uh, you know, two, three centimeters above the carina here so that we can ventilate both lungs. So we got a bunch of ways to check that we've intubated correctly. We look for chest wall rise. We listen in the axilla for breath sounds. We listen for an absence of breath sounds in the stomach. And we look for CO2 production, uh, which we can look through various CO2 detectors like the colorometric one, as well as the waveform capnography. And finally, we want to get a chest x-ray as well. So the final thing we'll talk about is what happens when the ventilator starts alarming when the tube is, when they're intubated. Uh, they give a mnemonic. They obviously don't think too much of me, but the mnemonic is DOPE, D-O-P-E. So the first thing you want to do when the ventilator starts alarming or the pulse ox drops is you want to disconnect them from the vent and then manually bag the patient. And then you're going to find out what it's like what to manually bag them. So let's go what, through what DOPE means. So it stands for the things that could go wrong. The tube could get dislodged, it could become obstructed, patient could get a pneumothorax, or the vent could fail. You could have an equipment failure. So the first thing you're going to do is disconnect them from the vent, vent and manually bag the patient, and you're also going to listen. So if the tube is dislodged, what you're going to find is that manually bagging the patient really doesn't improve anything. And you're probably, when you listen, you're not going to hear breath sounds. So in this case, you're just going to need, probably need to reintubate the patient. What happens when they're obstructed? You'll find that the patient is hard to bag. So in these cases, uh, maybe you need some tracheal suctioning. They may need to be reintubated as well. Uh, if it, they have a pneumothorax, you will hear decreased breath sounds on one side, so you'll have asymmetric breath sounds, and so they might need to get a chest tube. And for equipment failure, when you're bagging, you're going to find that they bag very easily and the SATs improve. And so now you just need to go get another vent. So I'm sorry we went a little bit longer with this video, but this is the pediatric airway. And the things you want to remember then, we went over uh, oxygen delivery and went over various different uh, techniques we can use to get air in from the oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway, the LMA, and the endotracheal tube, how to check for tube placement, and what to do when the uh, ventilator starts alarming or the SATs start dropping. All right, see you next time.